um, ecosystems taken broadly, ecosystems and biodiversity is becoming, I think it's a few years out there, but how you value those in total terms and the dependency on ecosystems, and uh, how you value them in country, com company terms is also being worked on. You see work being done. You've probably seen the team report at UNEP, but there's also uh, work being done by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and I'm uh, the, the group I'm involved with, with the Cambridge Centre for Sustainable Leadership, is also doing work on ecosystems and ecosystems impacts on organisations. Again, it's somewhere out there. Uh, global equity, I think, will become an increasing issue. Um, and if you want to get a bit further out there, there's something about business purpose being thought about. Um, why the why of business, not the what of business? Um, you would again. A WEF quote this year, uh, the, the you know, World Economic Forum has this big shindig in Davos where all the, the global leaders of business and, and quite a lot of politicians and ex-politicians turn up. Um, about a third of their agenda this year was uh, sustainability uh, influenced uh, and there were some elements talking about per business purpose including uh, the material that Michael Porter's produced recently on uh, on, on uh, how do you share the benefits of business between society and state, other stakeholders. Um, so that's a moving agenda. I think a lot of these ideas are some way out there. Um, but it just says that this is um, moving on. And I think that nature of that conversation, these are CEO conversations. And if you want to have intimate conversations business to business uh, with somebody who you're trying to supply, this CEO conversation around sustainability is an interesting way you want to start with. Uh, and some of the reasons for that is, the second point, sub-bullet point here, these are belief and values-based conversations. So they're difficult to argue with. It wouldn't be any good going to Coleman and say, I think you've got it wrong for Unilever. Um, because that's a fundamental core belief of that individual. And you can hear it when you hear him present on these things. And he presented on, uh, he did the launch of that um, uh, sustainable living agenda. Uh, you can hear it's a personal thing. Um, and they managed to, they have carried the board with them and say there is competitive advantage and financial advantage out of it, but it's, it's a personal belief thing. And the, the, the other point on there, which I think is very important, this is much more about openness, sharing of information, and integrity. Uh, so if you're seen as a, uh, an organization or a country of high integrity, uh, and you are open with your information, that's an advantage. Additional drivers, NGO activists, uh, there's always the risk of being outed. Um, I think Nestle, who got uh, attacked on their use of, of unsustainably produced palm oil. And I don't know if anybody's seen the picture of the Kit Kat, I don't know if it was, with a orangutan's finger, bloody finger sticking out of the top of the packet. That, that, that had huge impact in the UK. And they are now absolutely, I would say, you're often, it's probably a bit too hard, uh, but they are very sensitive to the sourcing of, of uh, palm oil. Uh, interestingly, NGOs, and you mentioned this, NGOs are also changing their perspective. All those leading organisations have good relationships with NGOs. And NGOs, a lot of them are thinking, if we want to leverage and make change, we need to do it through the instrument of business. So they're actually associating themselves, associating themselves. they're working with business to help move business agenda on. So you'll see people like WWF, for example, is probably a good example of an organisation that's totally changed its perspective. Uh, risks for NGOs on that, obviously, that they'll be, you know, subject to capture by the, the corporate agenda. Uh, but I think they're, you know, most of them have recognised it's no point in being pure if you're ineffective. So let's be effective, uh, and uh, and I think that engagement with NGOs is is, is a again it's a, it's a it goes back to the issue of openness and integrity. It helps demonstrate that you're not holding stuff back. Uh, integrated reporting. Uh, we talked about the IIRC, integrated reporting is about how do you include, incorporate a whole lot of other material in your, in your company reports, so non-financial data about other impacts you have on other systems. Um, that's, I would say, at least a five-year project that started about a year ago. Uh, it is, uh, and I would say even within that group there's not a, a lot of agreement about even what integrated reporting might mean, although it's now starting to, to get to an understanding of what the framework might mean. Um, the first framework, or first discussion framework, draft of the framework, I think was sort of completed a couple of weeks ago. And the other things on the agenda are COP17 and Rio plus 20. COP17 will be, I think, more effective than 16 was. 15 was, uh, I guess, a PR disaster. 16 
was a, a, a reconsolidation. 17 is going to be in, in Africa and there for South Africa, and therefore, because Africa is part of how do you help developing countries manage this transition, I think we'll now start to get more profile. And the other one is Rio Plus 20. Uh, Rio Plus 20 is in June of 2012, uh, 20 years on from the, the Earth Summit in, uh, in Rio. And this one's in Rio as well. Those summits have been going on for a long time, but the, I guess the, the, the most important one was the Rio Earth Summit in 2000, sorry, 1992. So what should we be thinking about here? Um, length of supply chains, um, it's not just distance, but it's length of supply chains. Um, one of the things you should be aware of, if, if you haven't already seen it, the supplier verification down supply chains is continuing. Um, so that's about your CSR positioning and also your integrity about what you've been reporting on in the content of material you're supplying. Um, we've had a few of those fairly significant companies over the last few weeks. Uh, IKEA was one which you could understand. Uh, but Shell was another one, so again, it sort of demonstrates that these are uh, fairly significant um, organizations who are now starting to say we need to make sure that our supply chain uh, will not cause us any embarrassment, if nothing else. Uh, closed loop manufacturing design, I think that does, again, because of the length of the distance that you supply a product into market, does give you some problem. I suspect that's a similar point that you're talking about when you talk about waste and packaging. How do you make sure that as much as possible, if not all, is recycled back through to the supply chain and back into the product analysis? Um, whole of life cycle analysis, that's both in terms of time. Uh, so if you're thinking about uh, the detergent's a good example. You know, when they look at detergent, they find most of the energy use in detergent is actually when you're using it, not when you're making it. So that's why we will use 35 degree uh, detergents in the UK now. Um, but it's also thinking about um, how do costs build up and how do impacts build up across the product. Um, an example, it's a simplistic one I like to give, is the Walker's Crisps example for uh, Tesco. They did carbon footprinting on packets of crisps. Uh, I always thought, why is that particularly useful? I'm a consumer, you know, your calories, salt, fat, now you've got carbon. How do I make a decision? What was really interesting was when they did that process, they understood the manufacturing process, fairly simple. Grow potatoes, harvest potatoes, store potatoes, make potato crisps, chips, sorry. Um, what they found was that this part was controlled by the farmer and the incentive on the farm was to keep the weight up because she sold on weight, so they kept them damp. And the first thing they had to do over here was to drive out the damp. So they changed just the nature of the payment and the nature of the supply chain. Storing them not damp is cheaper, less damp to drive out over here, so, and I, I can't remember now, but it was about 35% saving in energy costs in the whole supply chain. So, point is, it's not so much understanding that having a, a measurement, it's understanding the processes and how you can drive costs out of organisations. And once you start doing that, then you start saying, well, how do, where do we get to a position where we're sharing data with our customer supplier? Because, but there's also a competition point where we're trying to negotiate price. So, how do we, how do we manage that? Where do we share data? you know, horizontally between uh, competitors and where does it become competitively advantageous not to share that data. And I think there's much more, much deeper thinking to go on about that. I, again, the sort of continuation of the sustainable consumerism thing looked at all those issues about how you measure along a supply chain uh, and, and what are the processes and regulations you need to put in place to enable that. Um, so that's the point of visibility of activities and costs participants and the ability to partner. I think down here you'll be a taker on codes of conduct and environmental standards unless you make a conscious effort to try and influence them. And I, my feeling is you should be out there in the markets trying to sense what's changing and trying to influence those changes. You don't want another air miles coming at you blind, and blind, you know, blindsiding you. Uh, I think the air miles debate, by the way, has moved on a long way, not driven by New Zealand, but by driven by some of the other developing African countries saying there's a much broader thing to consider about this. Um, but be aware that things are changing and you can be blindsided by a change in the rules. Uh, and also water and ecosystem dependencies. I think huge advantage for New Zealand in water. Um, you, you, unusually, you've got lots of it. Um, it's probably not as good as it should be, but you at least have the advantage of having lots. So the messages. Um, I've talked about this before a bit. It is belief and values based. Um, 
if you're talking about the why of business, there's a hypothesis that actually Deloitte's working on that says uh, the business foundation of business is an ethical good, if you like, the delivery of services and products that improves the quality of human life. And if you start from that perspective, which is very much a sustainability perspective, by the way, it's, it's probably quite a good place to come from. But uh, whether you believe that you know, fundamental change to strategy and thinking about business is necessary, this agenda is continuing and it's inevitable. Uh, you talked about it ratcheting up. I, I see that all the time. It never moves back. It just moves forward. Uh, and even in the people talk about the global financial crisis, corporates did not decrease their spending and sustainability during that period. Individuals may have changed some of their preferences in terms of all the price premium they're prepared to pay, but I wouldn't be relying on that anyway. Um, it's a strategic issue for many corporates. Um, I think that, as I say, we've done strategy work now for, well, I don't know I meant to mention them, but a couple of mineral extraction organizations. Can you imagine doing sustainability strategy for those sort of, sort of businesses, as well as some of the more traditional ones in the consumer goods area? Um, I think there's a country, huge advantage in, in water, I might mention that. Um, the other thing in there, if you're moving to a position of openness uh, uh, about information, integrity is a really strong playing card. And you know, New Zealand is number two in, term, in terms of the world's most eth ethical countries after Sweden, I think, always after Sweden. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a card I don't see often being played here. Although I think it is accepted that, that New Zealanders tend to say something you know, they mean it, they've got no axe to grind particularly, there's, there's a sense of openness. Whereas some countries, if somebody says something, you really want to, you're going to, as they say, trust but verify. Um, so I think, that, you know, as a country, we should think about how we play that more to our advantage. And I put cleanish production uh, from, the, from the UK. This does look a very clean environment. But you do have some risks even in there. Risks, distance, obviously. Uh, the ability to engage on this agenda. Uh, I'm, encourage you to do as much as you can to, to, to first hand get some engagement with the suppliers, the people who you're supplying, and actually to have a conversation at a, at a much more heart level, an emotional level, about sustainability as an agenda, I think is a really, would be a really interesting way of approaching some of that. Uh, and there's, there's a possibility on the biodiversity history. If you ever look at you know, numbers of extinctions, uh, New Zealand's always a red on that, but I don't think anybody's actually going to hold that against you. Um, the way I like to think about it is if, if New Zealand was a company, I'd buy shares. I, I think this is a really, you know, really well positioned in terms of what's going to face us over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and I think the advantages outplay those risks, but you're certainly going to have to work at it to, to, to realise that benefit.